You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. I think all of us recognize that uh, the act is, is, is significant and the issues that the Commission faces uh, are significant. It goes without saying at this point that both the Department and key members of Congress have been very concerned for some time about the increasing number of non-substantial assistance downward departures. What um, the PROTECT Act is doing is saying judges can exercise their discretion, but we want to know why. We want the Commission to justify these reasons. It didn't change the fundamental or guiding principles of the guideline. Hello, and welcome to Sentencing and Guidelines, 2003 Amendments. This is the eighth program in a series, the series for sentencing and guidelines that the U.S. Sentencing Commission does in collaboration with the Federal Judicial Center. I'm Krista Rubin, Senior Education and Sentencing Practice Specialist for the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Today, we're going to focus on the 2003 amendments. As you already know, it's been a very busy year as far as amendments are concerned. It started in January of this year. The Commission responded to directives contained in the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation and the Campaign Finance Reform Act legislation. Then, as the year progressed, the President signed the PROTECT Act, and we got three new sets of amendments as a result of that PROTECT Act legislation. And then finally, on November the 1st of this year, our regular cycle amendments took effect. And we're going to be talking about all of those things today. But before we get into the meat of the program, I'd like to talk a little bit about some housekeeping items and also describe the format of the program to you. As far as housekeeping items are concerned, I'd like to remind you that this program does not have push-to-talk capability, and we also will not be accepting facts and questions of any kind. Uh, the other thing I want to point out to you is that uh, the DCN site provides some links to the U.S. Sentencing Commission's website where you can find materials regarding these 2003 amendments, including our Federal Sentencing Guidelines Manual for this year. Uh, also, this broadcast has been approved for CLE credits in certain jurisdictions, so please be sure to check the DCN site if you need further information regarding CLE credits. As for the format of the program, we're going to start our discussion today with our general counsel for the U.S. Sentencing Commission, Charles Tetzloff. He's going to be talking to Rachel Pierce, Education and Sentencing Practice Specialist with the U.S. Sentencing Commission. So since we have a lot to cover today, we're going to jump right into our panel discussion, and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Krista, and thank you, Charlie, for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, why don't we just go ahead and get started by talking generally about the PROTECT Act. Can you tell us um, basically what it is and how did the legislation come about? The uh, PROTECT Act was an amendment uh, to another piece of legislation, the uh, Amber Alert uh, legislation, which was passed by Congress in the spring of uh, this year. Uh, Representative Feeney uh, made an amendment to the Amber Alert legislation, which is referred to now as the PROTECT Act, and that uh, was a multifaceted amendment which covered a number of issues. Uh, first, uh, in, uh, I suppose primarily it uh, dealt with child sex offenses and child pornography in the sense that it increased uh, the penalties for a number of those uh, offenses. Uh, it both raised the statutory maximum penalties and uh, added and or increased some of the mandatory minimum penalties which were applicable to child sex offenses. Secondly, uh, the PROTECT Act dealt uh, with an area that Congress had been concerned with for a period of time, uh, which was non-substantial assistance departures. Um, <clears throat> I think Congress was concerned both with respect to uh, the number of departures and the increasing rate of those non-substantial assistance downward departures. And so uh, one of the things the PROTECT Act uh, did was to uh, actually make changes in the sentencing guidelines with respect to uh, those downward departures as they related to child sex offenses. Uh, 
Um, with respect to other downward departures, uh, it directed the Sentencing Commission to uh, review downward departures and to uh, make amendments uh, with an eye towards ensuring that uh, the frequency of downward departures was reduced. And the uh, Congress gave the Commission 180 days to accomplish that review and make those amendments. In addition, uh, it froze the Commission from making uh, further downward departures for a two-year period. In other words, the Commission was prohibited from uh, establishing any new downward departures until May 1 of 2005. In the area of appeals, uh, the law prior to the PROTECT Act had been uh, determined by the Kuhn case, and basically uh, that standard was a due deference standard to, that the appeal court would give to the trial court. Um, and it was an abuse of discretion standard. Uh, the PROTECT Act changed that and uh, basically established a de novo review uh, standard. And I'm generalizing a little bit because there are some uh, specifics that would have to be distinguished. Uh, another thing they did in the area of appeals was to uh, require that if a case or a sentencing is appealed and then it is remanded to the, to the trial court, that the trial court on resentencing could not establish a, uh, a new departure that had not been addressed at the time of the first sentencing and approved uh, in the course of the appeal. Uh, <clears throat> the PROTECT Act made some uh, direct, other direct amendments to the guidelines. For instance, in the area of acceptance of responsibility, uh, it made a direct change in the guidelines to require for the third point for acceptance uh, that can only be made uh, by way of a government motion. And it can only be based on a, the making of a timely guilty plea on the part of the defendant. Uh, the Congress also established uh, or actually directed the Sentencing Commission to uh, come up with a downward departure up to four levels for an early disposition program, what was commonly referred to as fast track. Uh, that's a uh, provision that existed primarily in the southwest border states uh, to provide, uh, because of their heavy caseloads, particularly in the area of immigration, uh, to give a benefit to defendants who made early pleas uh, or perhaps waived certain appeal rights uh, or waived deportation hearings. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, the PROTECT Act made provisions for improved data collection. <clears throat> and basically it provides that each chief judge in each district uh, is required within 30 days of the date of a judgment to provide a report of sentencing to the Commission, uh, including documents underlying that sentencing, such as uh, the charging document, the indictment or information, uh, a plea agreement, if any, uh, the uh, judgment and conviction, statement of reasons, and the pre-sentence report, and any other documents that the Commission might require. An example of that would be uh, if there was a uh, revision to the sentencing uh, under a Rule 35B proceeding. Mm -hmm. um, that's in an, a general overview of uh, what the PROTECT Act did. Okay. Now, can you tell us when, when did the PROTECT Act go into effect? And did all of the PROTECT Act go into effect at one time, or did portions of it? Was it staggered? Or give, give us a timeline, if you would. Well, generally, the PROTECT Act went into effect on April 30th of this year. Okay. Uh, there were some other key dates uh, as, uh, for example, some of the amendments that the PROTECT Act made directly to the guidelines were effective when the uh, PROTECT Act became effective, mm -hmm. which was that April 30th date. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other dates, however, uh, an example would be in the kidnapping area. 
uh, and there were direct amendments made to the guidelines uh, increasing the, uh, the penalties for kidnapping. Um, but that did not take effect until 30 days from April 30th or May 30th. And then finally, the other significant date is October 27th, which was the date that the uh, guideline amendments that the Sentencing Commission made in furtherance of the directive to review the downward departures. Uh, that, that has uh, been implemented and is now in effect as of October 27th. Okay, let's talk a little bit further about this directive that you mentioned to, to review departures. Um, the PROTECT Act gave the Commission 180 days to, to look at departures in general. Uh, can you tell us some of the things that the Commission did during that 180 days um, in order to respond to that directive? Well, the Commission did a lot in the sense that under its normal amendment cycle, uh, the Commission does such things as seeks public comment mm -hmm. on proposed amendments. Uh, many times they will hold public hearings. And of course, the staff and the Commission have numerous working sessions together to, to hammer out amendments. <clears throat> and uh, they followed the same course for this emergency amendment uh, uh, having to do with departures. But uh, it was, of course, on a telescope frame, mm -hmm. a time frame. And, uh, but they nevertheless did seek uh, input from the public, particularly the various uh, segments of the criminal justice community, uh, being the judiciary, the probation officers, defense, and prosecution. Uh, in addition, it held at least two public hearings, and I think you saw that on the opening segment, mm -hmm. uh, where you had judges and defense lawyers and prosecutors uh, all testifying to the commission. And then finally, uh, there was uh, some intensive staff work and working sessions with the commission uh, to meet the deadline that Congress had set. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that there's been quite a comprehensive report that, that the Departures Working Group, if you will, um, has presented to Congress. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was uh, uh, included. That was not part of the directive from Congress, but it was something that the Commission felt uh, was appropriate. Uh, one of the things uh, that is relevant in that report is that uh, one of the reasons Congress was concerned with downward departures was that uh, they were relying on an 18 percent departure rate. Um, and in the review that the Commission did, uh, which included a number of uh, uh, reviews of individual cases, and uh, uh, the result of that was it was determined that a number of these departures that were included in the 18 uh, percent were really uh, initiated by the government and the biggest example was in the area of the early disposition program or fast track uh, <clears throat> and if you took those cases out of the mix you would end up with a little over 10 percent uh, uh, downward departure rate and again, when I say downward departure, I mean non-substantial assistance right. uh, downward departures. Right. So I think that's one of the interesting uh, things that can be uh, pulled out of the report. Uh, but I commend that report uh, to our viewers as uh, uh, being quite enlightening. Mm -hmm. So at the end of this 180 days and the, and the public hearing and all of the work that the Commission did, uh, regarding looking into departures, uh, we, the Commission promulgated some new amendments to, to change departures in general. Can you tell us a little, bit, uh, a little bit of detail about what is contained in the October 27th amendments? Yeah, I, I don't know how much detail you want, but the Commission did, in their review of uh, downward departures, conclude uh, that some of them were inappropriate and indeed ended up prohibiting a number of departures in a number of areas. Uh, an example would be, for instance, uh, uh, a, a downward departure for acceptance of responsibility is prohibited. Uh, 
I think, on the theory that there is already a provision made for that. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be inappropriate. And there are a number of other downward departures that the Commission uh, has now prohibited. Um, in addition, the Commission, I would say, restricted or, or perhaps tightened uh, a number of departures in a number of other areas. Um, criminal history is an example. I think if our viewers uh, and what you and Krista are going to review later uh, in more detail, uh, you will see that in the area of criminal history there are uh, restrictions and a tightening of, of that departure. Mm -hmm. And similar examples can be given in the area of family ties and uh, diminished capacity. Um, the other thing the Commission did in, in their emergency amendments is to establish an early disposition program in accordance with the directive that Congress uh, gave it. So that now there is a provision for a downward departure uh, in accordance or in furtherance of an early disposition program which has been approved by the U.S. Attorney and the Attorney General um, uh, for, of up to four levels. Uh, and lastly, I think there's a general overview that uh, the Commission intends uh, downward departures to be uh, what I think they have described as rare and exceptional. That's right. That's right. And, and you are right. Krista and I will go over some of that in, in greater detail um, later in, in the broadcast. Now, you also mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that the PROTECT Act changed um, some things regarding data collection and reporting requirements. Can you tell us what the Commission may be doing um, in an effort to, to make um, these requirements a little bit easier on the courts? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I indicated uh, what the Chief Judges are now required to do, uh, and when those documents come into the Commission, um, uh, there is a provision uh, whereby should either the Judiciary Committees of either the House or the Senate request uh, copies of those documents, uh, uh, the Commission is obligated to uh, provide those. Uh, but I think the Commission uh, was very sensitive uh, to any additional requirements being imposed on uh, the judiciary uh, from the perspective of uh, the resources that that takes and the time that that takes away from that which the judges uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis. So mm -hmm. what has happened is the Commission has met with um, the Criminal Law Committee of the Judicial Conference and they are in the process of revising some of the forms, particularly the JNC and the Statement of Reasons. Uh, one of the things Congress required uh, was for the uh, sentencing judge to state with specificity any reason he or she has with respect to the giving of a uh, downward departure. And uh, uh, the hope is that in the revising of these forms, we'll be able to set out some blocks that the sentencing judge can check and hopefully save some of his or her time mm -hmm. uh, just by checking the block, which will represent uh, a particular reason for a particular sentence. Mm -hmm. Well, we have talked about a lot, of, a lot of changes as a result of the PROTECT Act. And inevitably, when we have changes such as this, there are always questions about ex post facto. Uh, can you comment on any possible ex post facto issues that, that may arise as a result of the PROTECT Act? Um, that's a difficult question. Uh, the Office of General Counsel certainly uh, tries not to give legal advice and uh, uh, take positions on particular issues. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say is that I think it is a reasonable uh, position to take is that uh, ex post facto issues may well be presented uh, arising out of the PROTECT Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it will be incumbent on the prosecutors and the defense counsel uh, to raise and identify these issues and of course uh, on the judiciary to resolve them. 
and they may have to work their way through the appellate system uh, before those get worked out. But uh, I think it would be very difficult for us to identify each and every issue that may be subject to ex post facto uh, consideration and those that will not. I think that's going to have to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. As there have been a number of amendments in, in response to the PROTECT Act, uh, the Commission has done a lot of work in this area. Um, is the Commission finished with the work, or are they still looking at the PROTECT Act? What does the future look like in, in regards to that? Uh, they certainly are not finished. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commission has made uh, very clear, first of all, a little bit of their frustration in the very short time frame they were given by Congress to accomplish uh, what Congress asked uh, the Commission to do. Uh, however, they did their job and uh, but secondly, the Commission made very clear uh, that they are not through uh, on uh, reviewing and analyzing uh, the issue of downward departures. Uh, probably a, a good example of that is in the area of early disposition program. Uh, I think they will continue to look at that particular issue uh, and there are a number of other downward departure areas, whether it be uh, criminal history or aberrant behavior uh, that I'm sure the Commission will continue to examine and uh, uh, I might add uh, would be receptive to uh, any views of the field on any of those issues because as, as we go forward uh, the Commission is always receptive to how things are working in the field and they want to hear from the field if there are uh, problems. That's right, that's right. Well, is there anything in, in closing, uh, with our discussion that is, that you'd like to add um, or any other points that you'd like to make? I, I think the only thing I would uh, underscore uh, is to encourage the uh, judges who are uh, stating, as the statute sta says, with specificity, mm -hmm. uh, their reasons for a particular sentence and particularly their reasons for a departure. Uh, it is a it will be extremely helpful to the Commission uh, to receive uh, as detailed and succinct uh, a description of the reasons for a particular departure, but perhaps equally or more importantly, it will be helpful to the judiciary uh, to, to make clear what the reason for a particular departure is, and particularly if there is a, uh, let's say the reason is uh, a government motion or a government plea agreement. Uh, that should be made clear. And then uh, it will help us to have as accurate data as we can. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. We, we truly appreciate your comments and your insight. Um, it's, been a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. For the remainder of the program, I will be joining Krista at the podium and we will talk more specifically about some of the issues that Charlie and I have already discussed, as well as, as, well as some of the other 2003 amendments. Um, but before that, we're going to take a five minute break and we'll see you back in five minutes.
Hi, and welcome back. Thanks for joining us. As you can see, Rachel has joined me here at the podium. And uh, we're going to spend the rest of today's broadcast talking specifically about the amendment changes over the past year. Um, it was a great discussion that you had with Charlie, uh, which right. gave us a good introduction to the PROTECT Act. And uh, we're going to start off our afternoon, actually, by talking about all the PROTECT Act amendments. First, the April 30th amendments, the kidnapping amendment on uh, May the 30th, mm -hmm. the departures amendments on October the 27th. Right. And then we're going to move into our regular cycle amendments and uh, talk about those that took effect on November the 1st of this year. So fasten your seatbelts because that's a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to start out with the PROTECT Act. And as we learned from the discussion earlier, uh, the, the main focus of the PROTECT Act deals with sanctioning for child sex crimes mm -hmm. and offenses against children. So the majority of the amendments we're going to be speaking about in regards to the PROTECT Act uh, do discuss uh, or do deal with these child sex crimes. Uh, however, there was a few amendments, as Charlie mentioned uh, when he was talking to you in the discussion, uh, that don't necessarily deal with child sex crime offenses. And the first one we're going to talk about uh, regarding the April 30th amendments uh, is one of those. Mm -hmm. And it deals with guideline 3E1.1, which is the guideline for acceptance of responsibility. And what the PROTECT Act did was directly amend this guideline, 3E1.1, and provided that uh, the additional one-level reduction is available only upon motion of the government. Uh, pr prior to this amendment taking effect on April the 30th, this one-level reduction was based on timely notification of a guilty plea and complete and truthful information. However, effective April 30th of this year, complete and truthful information is no longer a basis for uh, receiving this additional one-level reduction under 3E1.1. Now, I want to remind you that in order to get this additional one-level reduction, the defendant must have, ha must have an offense level of 16 or greater, and of course the defendant must qualify for the two-level reduction under 3E1.1A. So uh, that's our introduction to the PROTECT Act and the, and the amendments there. But we're going to move on and start talking about the changes in the areas of child sex crimes and kidnapping against minors. Um, and there was changes to both the statute and the guidelines. That's right. That's right. We're going to we'll start off, Krista, with the changes uh, in the statute relative to sex crime offenses. And then Krista will move on with what sort of changes you're going to see in the guidelines. Um, as far as statutory penalties are concerned, the first thing you're going to see is that a number of maximum penalties are going to be increased for certain types of child sex crime offenses. Um, crimes such as pornography, traveling um, interstate with intent to engage in sexual activity with a minor, those, those types of offenses. You'll also see some minimum penalties that have been added for certain offenses. For example, kidnapping of a minor now carries a 20-year mandatory minimum penalty. Um, there are additional changes regarding supervised release. The courts are now able to keep a sex offender on supervised release for any term of life uh, any term of years, excuse me, or life if the court so chooses. Um, additionally, there's no statute of limitations for child abduction or sex crimes um, and no pretrial release for charges of child rape or child abduction. Uh, finally, in reference to the statute, um, there is a provision for what is basically known as two strikes, you're out. And, and this provides for mandatory life imprisonment for sex offenders uh, in which the instant offense is a sex offense against a minor and the defendant has one prior uh, similar offense. So very important statutory changes that you need to be aware of. Uh, Krista, why don't you get us started with the changes to the guidelines that we'll see as a result of the PROTECT Act. Absolutely. Again, there were some direct amendments made to the sentencing guidelines as a result of the PROTECT Act. Uh, and specifically on April 30th, Congress amended the guideline 2G 2.2 .2, uh, that deals with the trafficking and receipt of child pornography. And what Congress did in this instance was they added a specific offense characteristic based on the number of images involved in these types of offenses. Uh, as you can see from the slide, there's a potential of a five, up to a five-level increase under guideline 2G 2.2 for offenses that would involve 600 or more images. Uh, additionally, Congress directly amended guideline 2G 2.4, which is the guideline that deals with possession of child pornography. Uh, the specific offense characteristic for the number of images that we just saw uh, added to 2G 2.2 has also been added to 2G 
Additionally, another specific offense characteristic was added if the pornography involved in the offense involved any sadistic, masochistic, or violent conduct. So Congress has uh, added that specific offense characteristic. That four-level increase is already included in Guideline 2G2.2, so Congress simply added that to the Possession Guideline at 2G2.4. Mm -hmm. Now one thing that I do want to mention about the image's specific offense characteristic is that there it currently is no definition of image. So there may be some situations where the courts are going to be deciding on what constitutes an image. For example, if I take a photograph of a room full of 10 people, some people may ask if that is one image or if that represents 10 separate images because there are 10 individuals in the picture. Additionally, when you have offenses that involve AVI files or video, uh, some people have asked whether uh, each individual section of the AVI file, each individual clip, if that, is, uh, if that constitutes an image in and of itself. Also, there may be some issues dealing with uh, computer-generated images, morphed pictures, and whether they, they constitute images as well. So uh, hopefully we'll hear some more about that uh, as the time goes on. One other guideline change I do want to mention before I turn it back over to Rachel is a change that Congress made to guideline 4B1.5. And this guideline deals with uh, repeat and dangerous sex offenders against minors. This guideline operates very much like a career offender guideline in that it's a criminal history override. This guideline has been changed to say that a pattern of activity includes two separate occasions of prohibited sexual conduct with only one minor. Now, prior to this change, uh, it re this guideline required uh, two separate occasions of prohibited sexual conduct involving two different minors. Right. But Congress changed that directly, and now it only involves one minor. So right. anyone who has abused uh, a child more than once potentially could be subject to this enhancement under 4B1.5B. That's right. That's right. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about child sex crimes and downward departures. Mm -hmm. as, as we've seen from our discussion thus far, the PROTECT Act focused primarily on child sexual crimes, crimes against ch children involving sexual exploitation and, and that sort of things. Also focused on, very heavily on downward departures, and specifically in the area of child sex crimes. Um, you're going to see changes to the statute and to the guideline manual as well. In, uh, so the downward departures are only available in cases of substantial assistance where the defendant is cooperating with the government and providing substantial assistance or other limited mitigating circumstances that you are going to find only in Chapter 5, Part K of the Guideline Manual. You're going to be focusing only in, in this portion of the Guideline Manual for permissible circumstances for downward departures in child sex crime cases. Any of those circumstances that are listed only, again, as I said, in Chapter 5, Part K, that are not adequately taken into consideration by the guidelines, and that should result in a different sentence, are going to be the circumstances that the court can look at. Reiterating that any other mitigating circumstance found elsewhere in the guideline cannot be used as a basis for downward departure in a child sex crime case. Those of you who are familiar with departures and departure lingo in general, you know, you may be aware that there are other departure grounds in Chapter 2 commentary, for example, in application notes in the background commentary uh, sometimes. Adequacy of criminal history in Chapter 4 is another reason for downward departure. These are off limits now to the courts for purposes of downward de downwardly departing in child sex crime cases. So it's important to keep in mind that we're really focusing on Chapter 5, Part K. But there are some other interesting things that have kind of happened in Chapter 5, Part K. Uh, we have a new uh, permissible circumstance for departure. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Krista? Absolutely. What Congress did in this instance basically was to remove or take some language from Chapter 5, Part H, which is the language dealing with uh, departures in the area of specific offender characteristics. And they moved those into a new guideline at 5K 2.22. And this new guideline provides that for, in instances where a court would, would potentially downward depart uh, in a child sex crime case, age, which is at 5H 1.1, and extraordinary physical impairment at 5H 1.4 
are permissible grounds for downward departures in child sex crime cases. Uh, what is not permitted as grounds for downward departure, which is contained in this new guideline, is drug, alcohol, or gambling dependence or abuse. So the Congress has made those specific changes at guideline 5K2.22, this new uh, policy statement found in Chapter 5, Part K. Uh, additionally, Congress has limited the circumstances available in Chapter 5, Part K for downward departures in child sex crime offenses. There are two instances that cannot be used and are not permissible for downward departures in child sex crimes, and those are aberrant behavior found at 5K 2.20 and also diminished capacity, which is at 5K 2.13. So just to emphasize, those are not going to be able to be used for downward departures in child sex crime cases. Congress also gave the Commission a directive regarding downward departures in general, and this was something that Charlie mentioned earlier in the broadcast today, and that is that the Commission is not able to add any additional grounds for downward departures to Chapter 5, Part K on or before May 1st of 2005. So we will not be adding any additional factors or circumstances in that section for another couple of years. That's right. Uh, you know, we've talked about the April 30th amendments. We've mm -hmm. covered the statutory changes. We've talked about the changes to trafficking and receipt of child pornography, possession of child pornography, the changes in the departure language and the guidelines manual, and that pretty much wraps up the April 30th changes. Right. Why don't you tell us about the May 30th changes? Okay, well, effective May 30th, there was really only one, one amendment or one set of, of amendments that went into effect, and that was in relation to kidnapping. Um, as, as we've stated already, the PROTECT Act was very uh, focused on child sex crimes and uh, crimes against children. Mm -hmm. So I as a response to that, there were some changes made to the kidnapping guideline. Uh, the first thing you're going to see at the kidnapping guideline at 2A4.1 is a base offense level increase from 24 to 32. And in this, of course, is to reflect the increase in the statutory penalty that I mentioned earlier, and now that kidnapping has a mandatory minimum of 20 years. For those uh, kidnap minors. For kidnapping minors, right. So, in addition to this, what you're going to see is some changes um, for the specific offense characteristics. We have a deletion of the one level reduction for releasing a victim before 24 hours had elapsed. Um, and an increase, a six-level increase, formerly a three-level increase, if the victim was sexually exploited. Again, dovetailing with the concerns uh, raised by the PROTECT Act uh, regarding the exploitation of uh, sexual exploitation of children. So we've covered the April 30th amendments. We covered the one uh, May 30th amendment. Um, let's go on to talk a little, bit, a little bit about the October 27th amendments, and then, of course, we'll move to the November 1st. Um, but let's get started. Why don't you get us started with the October 27th, Krista? Sure. And then, well, we heard a lot about these October 27th amendments in your discussion with Charlie. Right. Uh, we, we heard about the 180-day period of review. Mm -hmm. And uh, these changes that we're going to go through now reflect all the work of the Commission during that 180-day period. And these are the changes that the Commission made to the guidelines mm -hmm. in order to respond to the directive to substantially reduce the instances of non-substantial assistance downward departures. So the first thing that the Commission did was they went into Chapter 5, Part K, and elsewhere in the guidelines manual that deals with departures, and they tried to tighten up the language in order to emphasize that departures should be rare and exceptional, as Charlie said this morning. But one thing you need to become familiar with are some new terms that you'll see in the guidelines manual. You know, in the past, before this, this amendment was passed on October the 27th, when we talked about departures, we would be talking about factors for departures, uh, extraordinary factors for departures, uh, things that were forbidden in the area of departures, and also departures for combination of factors. However, now in the guidelines manual, you are going to be seeing these new terms. Instead of factors, you will see circumstances. Uh, exceptional is a new term that you will see uh, very often in 5K 2.0. Uh, prohibited is the term that's going to be used now, as well as multiple circumstances instead of combination of factors. So we're all going to have to get a little bit more familiar with this language change in the manual. And again, 
This is just to emphasize and tighten up the language in order to comply with the directive from Congress that there needs to be a substantial reduction in the use of non-substantial assistance downward departures. Uh, also uh, regarding the uh, departures in 5K 2.0, with uh, the exception of commission identified departure circumstances, all departures must be both rare and exceptional. So you can see just how uh, serious uh, the commission was in, in responding to Congress's directive to us to reduce those downward departures. So now we're talking about circumstances that can possibly be used, but they must be rare and exceptional. exceptional. But the Commission went one step farther. They didn't just tighten up the language regarding departures. They did some other things also. You're absolutely right. And Charlie did touch on this in, in our discussion in that there were certain circumstances that the Commission did outright prohibit as reasons for a downward departure. Um, and, and these really came from the study of looking at uh, the different cases when the departure team was looking at the different cases and the reasons that the courts were departing and uh, making an assessment at that point that that certain circumstances that the courts were using for departure were no longer going to be acceptable. For example, example acceptance of responsibility or aggravating or mitigating role, um, sometimes characterized as super acceptance of responsibility or super aggravating or super mitigating role. Uh, the Commission has decided that these are no longer permissible reasons for departure. A plea of guilty or a plea agreement in and of itself is no longer a uh, permissible circumstance for departure. One of the things that uh, we learned at the, at the Commission in, in looking at departures is that one of the, the biggest reasons for departure was pursuant to a plea agreement. Um, and really no other reason to, to elaborate on that was given by in, in, in a number of these cases. And so pursuant to a plea agreement, uh, the Commission didn't feel was a, an adequate reason for departure and therefore required that a plea agreement in and of itself or a plea, guilt, uh, plea of guilty would not be a permissible reason for departure. Uh, another reason that some courts were departing is if the defendant paid his restitution either in full or early. Um, as, as those of you who deal with a lot of these defendants know, a lot of these defendants are not capable of paying restitution. So some courts were departing on the basis of defendants paying their restitution um, often and early, sometimes you hear them say. Um, the Commission has decided that this is no longer uh, an acceptable uh, circumstance for a downward departure and of course any other circumstance that is specifically prohibited. Uh, an, an example of another specifically prohibited circumstance um, we're, you'll find at chapter uh, 5 part H, specifically 5H 1.4. Now Krista you mentioned earlier that gambling addiction was uh, specifically prohibited for defendants involved in child sex crimes and the Commission really felt that a gambling addiction is really never a good reason for departure and so it's been added as a new prohibited circumstance. Uh, I've talked about prohibited circumstances and there are, there are other areas that the Commission really just sort of went into the guideline manual and tightened up the language a little bit. And one of the areas that you'll find this is adequacy of criminal history at 4A 1.3. Mm -hmm. um, the language here now is going to prohibit a departure below a criminal history category of one. Um, in looking at these cases, we were seeing that what some courts were doing was departing below a criminal history category of one, really by just taking offense levels off uh, of the defendant's um, offense level conduct or calculation because there's really no way to depart below uh, an offense category or a criminal history category of one. Um, also in uh, criminal history downward departures, uh, we've restricted downward departures for career offender to only one criminal history category. Um, some courts were departing two levels uh, down to a, a criminal history category of four. The majority of the courts, however, were only departing one level. And so keeping that in mind, uh, the Commission felt like that, that really only a departure of one level down to a criminal history category of five would be appropriate for a defendant who qualifies as a career offender. In addition, um, some prohibitions on downwardly departing for armed career criminal. The courts can not at all depart if a defendant qualifies as an armed career criminal and additionally cannot depart if the defendant is a repeat and dangerous sex offender as, as characterized by 4B 1.5. Again, dovetailing with the concerns that are raised in the PROTECT Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so following with that theme, you know, Rachel, you've talked about some prohibitions that are at 5K 2.0. You mentioned the uh, restrictions on the adequacy of criminal history category mm -hmm. departure. 
And there are other restrictions and stricter standards, let's say, in a, a number of departure circumstances that are found in Chapter 5. So uh, let's take a look at this slide, uh, which talks about the guidelines or policy statements that are requiring, uh, that have further requirements and or restrictions for downward departures. The first guideline we're going to talk about is uh, Family Ties and Responsibilities, which is found at 5H 1.6. And what the Commission has done in this instance is provide some additional language in the guideline itself as well as language in the application notes following the guideline to give the court some guidance as to uh, what should be considered uh, in an instance where perhaps or potentially a downward departure based on family ties and responsibilities uh, could be granted by the court. Uh, there's specific uh, instruction to the court to look at the impact of the defendant's imprisonment upon the financial, if, if there's a financial burden on the family. Uh, the guideline requires that uh, to look at, you know, the, the involvement of the defendant, if anybody in this family was involved in the offense. So there's some, there's some good language in 5H 1.6 that's really going to guide the courts. Uh, victim conduct at 5K 2.10 uh, also has some additional language that tightens up the use of this particular uh, provision of the guidelines for a downward departure, and that is that the courts are going to look at how the victim's conduct impacted on the defendant's commission of the offense, what impact it had, and, and the departure should be proportionate to that. Uh, similarly, with coercion and duress, at 5K 2.12, uh, how much the coercion uh, really push the defendant to get involved in the offense. There's again this sort of proportionality or looking at uh, how the coercion and duress uh, push the, or in, involve the defendant in committing a particular offense. So that's an area the court may look to for a downward departure. Uh, and finally, diminished capacity at 5K 2.13. Uh, there's some more language in that guideline as well uh, that deals with uh, specifically uh, how much the diminished capacity affected the, the involvement of the defendant in the offense. So you see some sort of proportionality arguments as far as victim's conduct, coercion and duress, or diminished capacity, and how that impacted on the defendant's involvement in the instant offense. So there's some, strict, uh, there's some more strict standards there uh, found in those particular provisions. Another area of downward departures that uh, has been revised as a result of these October 27th amendments uh, is in the area of aberrant behavior, which is found at guideline 5K 2.20. Um, requirements and prohibitions have been expanded under this provision. Uh, for example, a serious drug trafficking offense, if, if a defendant is convicted of a serious drug trafficking offense, uh, they're prohibited from receiving a downward departure under this particular provision at 5K 2.20. And this includes mandatory minimum cases, even if the safety valve applies. Additionally, there's also a limitation on the past criminal behavior of a particular defendant. And what the Commission has done in this instance is to say that if a defendant has more than one criminal history point or otherwise has a serious prior incident of uh, criminal behavior in his or her past, that they are precluded from receiving a downward departure under this section of aberrant behavior. Uh, and, and the Commission has defined that uh, in the guideline and the application notes. So take a look at 5K 2.20 uh, for further information regarding aberrant behavior. Um, also, we often heard about departures for based on a combination of factors prior to our amendment change of uh, October the 27th. Uh, now, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, these uh, departures actually involve multiple circumstances. And the Commission has provided some guidance at Guideline 5K 2.0 regarding these particular offenses. Uh, when we take a look at 5K 2.0C, uh, a case where no single characteristic is sufficient to provide the basis for a departure, but where there are multiple circumstances uh, that taken together make the case exceptional, uh, it's possible that uh, the courts may look to 5K 2.0 and, uh, and do a departure based on multiple circumstances. But in addition, 5K 2.0 also says that in a departure for multiple circumstances, each circumstance must be present to a substantial degree uh, and that each, so that standing alone, each circumstance must be present to a substantial degree 
And additionally, each circumstance must be identified in the guidelines as a permissible ground for a departure. So that is to say that if that circumstance is not listed in our guidelines manual, that circumstance cannot be included for a downward departure based on multiple circumstances. They can be commission identified circumstances only and they must be present to a substantial degree alone and then taken as a whole make the case exceptional. So there's some changes there at 5K 2.0. Uh, one thing I do want to mention about guideline 5K 2.0 is that you really need to get yourselves familiar with all of the language that's in that guideline now. Uh, this guideline really functions as um, an overview of how departures work under the guideline system at this point. And so it's going to be really important for you to get familiar with uh, all the provisions at 5K 2.0 uh, and learn about the different circumstances, uh, the rare and exceptional qualitative and quantitative uh, qualifiers for departures. Uh, so I just want to suggest to everyone to take a good look at 5K 2.0. Uh, which will give you some guidance as to these new October 27th amendments. That's absolutely right. That you got to become real familiar. The courts are going to have to become familiar with the terminology and and what circumstances are permissible and what which ones have now been prohibited, um, forbidden for the courts to use. That's right. Um, and the buzzword, as Charlie left us with um, at the end of his discussion, is going to be specificity. And the courts have to be specific in providing their reasons for departure. That's right. Um, the PROTECT Act requires that the courts give specific reasons for departure in the written judgment and commitment order. General mitigating cir circumstances, which is the reason that we found a lot um, without anything else will not be a sufficient reason for departure anymore. Um, and so we can't, I don't think we can reiterate enough uh, specificity, the buzzword of specificity. We have to be specific. The courts have to be specific with their reasons for departure. Now, the last thing I want to touch on before we actually move into the November 1st, 2003 amendments is this fast-track departure. Charlie also talked a bit about this in our discussion earlier today. Um, but let's take a look at uh, the early disposition departure or the fast-track departure as it's commonly called. Um, the new uh, departure provision is found at 5K 3.1. And this applies only for a program that is authorized by the Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney in the particular district that is um, promulgating this early disposition program. It requires a motion from the government and it allows the court to depart but not more than four levels in, mm -hmm. in an early disposition program case. Now, we were seeing these, as, as Charlie talked about earlier, I think, in a lot of immigration cases. Um, and, and some districts have been doing this for a number of years. And, and what the Commission has done in response to the PROTECT Act is really just memorialized what um, a lot of circuits have already been doing mm -hmm. and placed some restrictions on it in that we can only depart four levels. Um, the, the requirement that the motion come from the government, I think, was is something that has been the courts have been doing. Right. Um, and this particular uh, amendment at 5K 3.1, this new policy statement, uh, addresses the other directive that was given to the Commission right. for the October 27th amendments. So not only was the Commission charged with uh, re substantially limiting the number of downward departures, but at the same time memorializing these early disposition programs, which as Charlie mentioned, is probably one of the highest or the most frequently used reason for downward departure as we saw in our That's departure right. report. Absolutely. So uh, we, we, the, you can see the Commission has complied with both of those right. uh, directives there. Okay, so now we've <laughs> talked about, uh, we're keeping a running list, we've talked <laughs> about the April 30th amendments mm -hmm. as a result of the PROTECT Act. We talked about the kidnapping amendment uh, on May the 30th, also as a result of the PROTECT Act. And we finished up our discussion of the PROTECT Act by talking about the amendments effective on October the 27th. Right. Well, now we're going to be moving into our regular cycle amendments, the amendments that, as you know, go into effect every year on November the 1st. And the cycle that the Commission follows as far as the amendments go is to submit uh, the amendments, the proposed amendments, on May 1st to the Congress. And absent any action from Congress, these amendments take effect on uh, November the 1st uh, every year. Sometimes, however, there are instances where Congress will give us particular directives with emergency amendment authority. And in those particular cases, the Commission makes amendments uh, at di during different times of the year. And I sort of mentioned this in our opening, 
that uh, really our amendments began this year on January the 25th. We first saw amendments to the sentencing guidelines as a result of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the uh, Campaign Finance Reform Act. And both of these contained emergency, uh, leg or emergency authority excuse me, for the commission, and so amendments took effect on January the 25th. Now, whenever we have emergency authority to make amendments, uh, the commission needs to repromulgate these amendments to make them permanent. And what that means is we send these amendments back to Congress during our regular amendment cycle. We send them on May the 1st, and they are uh, then absent any action from Congress. They take effect on November the 1st. Uh, and so some of the amendments that we deal with under emergency authority sometimes are modified in the interim. Uh, one of those amendments, uh, one of the amendments that we, we did in January, meaning the Sarbanes-Oxley Act amendments, they've been modified in their repromulgation. Uh, the campaign reform amendment, there's a new guideline at 2C1.8. That remains the same from the emergency amendment that you all saw on January the 25th. But we're going to start now by talking about the Sarbanes-Oxley Amendment. And the majority of the amendment happens in guideline 2B1.1. Uh, there's a base offense level of 7 now uh, as an alternative to a base offense level of 6. If the defendant is convicted of an offense with a statutory maximum of 20 years or higher. Uh, this base offense level is only available to defendants who get to guideline 2B1.1 by going through 1B1.2. 1B1.2 is a general provision found in Chapter 1 that basically tells the courts how to apply or how to find the sentencing guideline. So if they're going directly to 2B1.1 from your offense of conviction or from Appendix A, uh, it potentially a base offense level of 7 would apply if the statutory maximum is 20 years or greater. This would not apply, this alternative base offense level would not apply in an instance where a defendant is cross-referenced from another guideline. For example, if uh, someone is a felon in, pos in possession and for some reason uh, cross-referenced over to 2B1.1, uh, when you're applying the guideline 2B1.1 in that instance, the alternative base offense level of 7 would not be applied. In addition, there are uh, some specific offense characteristics that were added as a result of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, one of those deals with the, uh, endangering the solvency and security of a large number of victims. That was added on January the 25th. Already existing in this guideline, 2B1.1, was a victim's table where the courts could increase the, specific, the uh, offense level based on the specific offense characteristic for the number of victims involved in an offense. What the Commission has done now is to say that if both of these specific offense characteristics are applicable, the total amount of levels that can be added would be eight levels. So there's a cap of eight uh, when both of these specific offense characteristics are applicable in a particular case. Additionally, uh, a specific offense characteristic covering securities law was added uh, in January, but the scope has been expanded uh, to now include violation of commodities law and also to include uh, registered brokers and dealers. So there's some new language under that uh, application note corresponding to that specific offense characteristic and new language in the specific offense characteristic as well that you'll need to be familiar with. Uh, finally, the, the last thing I want to mention about the Sarbanes-Oxley amendments is a change to the perjury guideline at 2J1.3. Uh, the base offense level under this guideline has been increased from 12 to 14. Uh, in January, the obstruction of justice guideline at 2J1.2, uh, there was an increase in the base offense level there. It went from a 12 to a 14. The Commission, now in their regular amendment cycle, effective on November the 1st, uh, has changed the perjury guideline. Uh, the base offense level now looks exactly like the base offense level in the obstruction of justice guideline. So that takes care of the Sarbanes-Oxley amendments. Uh, and as, as I've been saying, this has been legislative, legislatively driven. Uh, and the Commission continues to respond to congressional legislation uh, in some amendments dealing with terrorism. As you know, Congress has been very concerned, uh, and as we all have been, with uh, terrorist activities uh, in our country. And so Congress has been passing some legislation, not limited to the Patriot Act, that 
changed some things under the guidelines or, or called the commission to change some things under the guidelines regarding these issues. So taking a look at the terrorism amendments then, uh, money laundering and terrorism. Guidelines 2S1.1 and 2S1.3 have been amended uh, to remove uh, an increase for terrorism because we already have an increase for terrorism in the Chapter 3 adjustments under the guidelines. Uh, 2X3.1 is a guideline where a defendant who harbors a fugitive uh, would be sentenced under the, under the guidelines manual. The Commission has uh, decided that if someone is harboring a terrorist, they should be treated differently than someone who is harboring a fugitive. Uh, anyone harboring a fugitive is, uh, has a maximum offense level of 20, a cap of 20 under 2X3.1. That cap's removed for any defendant who is convicted of harboring terrorists. Uh, 2M6.1 has been amended dealing with biological agents and toxins. And a new 2Q1.4 has been added to deal with issues involving water system tampering uh, and threatening to do those types of behavior. Mm -hmm. So we do have some changes in our guidelines that uh, directly deal with terrorism. Mm -hmm. Another example of a legislative directive would be in the, in the area of cybercrime. Uh, this would be for violations of 18 U.S.C. Section 1030. The corresponding guideline would be 2B1.1. And these are, are really known as uh, your, your typical hacker cases when uh, somebody's trying to hack into a computer system and, and causing all kinds of mayhem. Um, what you will see at the guideline is increases for the guideline sentence if the offense involved a protected computer system, such as uh, a computer system at the FBI or the CIA that, that the defendant's trying to hack into. Um, if the offense involved intent to obtain personal information, for example, if a defendant is trying to break into someone's email system or email account or personnel information or, or something along those lines, or if the offense involved a substantial disruption of a critical infrastructure. Now, what you will find in the application notes is some guidance as to what the Commission considers situations in which these types of offenses uh, create a substantial disruption to a critical infrastructure. So that's a, an example of a legislative directive. Now, the Commission is not only bound by legislative directives when making amendments to the guidelines. The Commission can also uh, turn to what they call their own initiative and, and change a guideline um, based on any reason they see fit. Generally, it's because of concerns that are raised from the field, uh, questions that, that those in the field have about how uh, the application of a certain guideline works. Um, and a good example of this would be the immigration guideline, specifically at 2L1.2, the illegal reentry guideline. Um, there have been a number of changes that have been made over the last couple of years in, res in respect to this guideline. Um, and we've gone in and added some things this amendment cycle for 2003. We've added a definition of alien smuggling, a definition of child pornography, and a definition of human trafficking. And these uh, definitions basically refer you back to the statute. We've clarified uh, the crime of violence definition. Um, in 2001, the Commission uh, changed the guideline at, at 2L1.2 to provide for graduated sanctioning depending on the prior conviction that the defendant has. Um, as those of you who are familiar with the illegal reentry guideline, um, you know that, that a defendant would have gotten 16 level increase for a prior aggravated felony without any consideration as to what type of aggravated felony that, that prior conviction might have been. So in 2001, the Commission decided that they would provide a, a tiered approach or graduated sanctioning depending on the type of prior conviction. And there are prior convictions such as crime of violence, drug trafficking offenses, human trafficking offenses, certain types of offenses that have been carved out for purposes of increase at the legal reentry guideline. Now, what was happening is that there were problems with the crime of violence definition, and courts were having issues in determining which sort of sentences or prior sentences or convictions were crimes of violence. The issue was that the crime of violence definition was written as a two-pronged definition. And it was written in, in a way that it had the, the prior conviction had to have the element use or attempted use of physical force against the person of another or it had to be one of the specific offenses that was enumerated in the application note. And the confusion came in uh, in where some courts were confused as to do they have to have both prongs in order to meet the definition of crime of violence or is one prong sufficient. So what the Commission has done for this amendment cycle has, has clarified 
um, by really rewording and sort of reworking that crime of violence definition that only one prong is needed. It either has to be one of those offenses that is specifically enumerated or the element of the offense has to have the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against the person of another. Additionally, the guideline prohibits the use of juvenile adjudications. There was some discussion over whether or not juvenile adjudications could be used to enhance a defendant's sentence at 2L1.2. Another issue that we uh, found out that came up a lot was what to do with revocation time. As I mentioned, um, the courts were looking at different types of, of prior convictions drug trafficking offenses, crime of violence. Now for the drug trafficking offenses, there was a requirement that the court look additionally at what sort of sentence was imposed. If the sentence imposed was under 13 months, um, a certain increase was given. If the sentence imposed was over 13 months, a different increase was given. And so the question of course arose, what do I do with revocation time? What if the defendant gets a certain sentence um, that puts him under a certain category but has that sentence revoked? Do I add that time onto the revocation? Does that change, uh, add that revocation time onto the original sentence? And that, does that then change what sort of increase the defendant is going to get? So the commission clarified that prior revocation time is to be added to the original term of imprisonment the same way it's treated for purposes of criminal history in determining drug trafficking offense and sentence imposed. Uh, the commission also clarified that in looking at the length of the prior sentence, um, specifically an indeterminate sentence, the courts need to look at what the stated maximum is. So for example, if, if the, the prior sentence is a sentence of one to five years, the courts would be looking at the five-year sentence that was imposed. Moving on to body armor. This is a, uh, an amendment to Chapter 3, um, Chapter 3 adjustment that is uh, for all types of offenses. But specifically, in, in this case, for a defendant who's been convicted of a drug trafficking crime or a crime of violence. If that inf offense involved the use of body armor, the defendant will be subject to an increase of two. If the defendant used the body armor, then that defendant is subject to an increase of four. It's important to note the difference here between offense and defendant increases. Offense, of course, is the offense of conviction in all relevant conduct, so that a defendant might be held accountable for someone else's behavior as part of a jointly undertaken criminal activity. The defendant-based enhancement, of course, is based on what exactly the defendant was responsible for. Mm -hmm. So a two or a four level increase based on what the offense involved versus what the defendant did. And another point I want to make about the use of body armor here is that it requires the active use of body armor, not mere possession. And use means active use, such as employment, or just using the body armor to barter mm -hmm. in you know, drug situations or that type of thing. Great. And the and drug trafficking offense is defined at the statute, is That's that right. right? Drug trafficking and crime of violence okay. both defined at the statute, yeah. Okay. Well, moving away from Chapter 3 and our new 3B1.5, uh, we're again going to dive into Chapter 5 for some amendment changes. Uh, this amendment, which took effect on November the 1st of this year, is an amendment to Guideline 5G1.3. And as most of you know, Guideline 5G1.3 deals with situations where a defendant is serving an undischarged term of imprisonment and what the court should do with that undischarged term of imprisonment, meaning that should the instant federal offense run concurrently, consecutively, or partially concurrently to that undischarged term. Uh, 5G 1.3a provides that in certain situations a consecutive sentence should be given, for example, if the defendant committed the instant federal offense while serving a term of imprisonment. That was not amended. However, 5G 1.3b was amended. 5G 1.3b is the section of this guideline that talks about sentencing uh, a defendant concurrently, meaning for the undischarged term of imprisonment that he or she's already serving, the instant federal offense should run concurrently if certain criteria are met. Prior to our amendment, effective on November the 1st, all that 5G 1.3b said was that if the offense was fully taken into account, if the undischarged term was fully taken into account uh, in the calculation for the instant offense, the Commission has gone in and clarified what fully taken into account means. There were some circuit conflicts that needed some resolution, and so this is the new language that you'll see at 5G 1.3b. An adjustment for imprisonment already served is given if the undischarged term is relevant conduct to the instant offense, and if it results in an increase in the offense level for the instant offense. 
so you will see that uh, now under this guideline, uh, not only will a concurrent sentence be given, but as was in the past, credit or an adjustment for the sentence will be given if the undischarged term of imprisonment meets those criteria. Moving on to Section 5G 1.3C, this provision of this guideline gives the court some discretion as to whether to sentence, uh, to make a sentence concurrent or consecutive to an undischarged term if they don't otherwise meet 5G 1.3A or 5G 1.3B. There was an issue in particular with sentences imposed upon revocation. And so what the commission did was say that uh, at 5G 1.3C that this applies to revocation sentences. And the commission recommends that the sentences run consecutively, but the court, of course, retains discretion in this instance. Uh, so you will see that change at 5G 1.3C. Another change at 5G 1.3C uh, tells us that the, an adjustment for imprisonment that's already been served cannot be given for an undischarged sentence covered under 5G 1.3C. So what this is telling us is that the only time you can have uh, the sentence adjusted for time already served on an undischarged term is only if it qualifies under 5G 1.3B, meaning that it's relevant conduct to the instant offense and it has resulted in an increase in the offense level for the instant offense. So no adjustment can be given under 5G 1.3C. Those are the changes to 5G 1.3. I do want to mention a departure provision. This departure provision 5K2.23 provides for a downward departure where 5G 1.3B would have applied if the term of imprisonment was undischarged at the time of the sentencing for the instant offense. So 5K2.23 is dealing with discharged terms of imprisonment. So a downward departure could potentially apply uh, at 5K 2.23 for a discharge term if it was relevant conduct and uh, otherwise would have met the criteria at 5G 1.3B. Mm -hmm. Now you're probably going to ask me why the Commission added this departure language to Chapter 5 Part K when the PROTECT Act specifically said that we could not add any departure language to Chapter 5 Part K on or before May 1st, 2005. So why did the Commission add this to Chapter 5 Part K? <laughs> well, <laughs> the answer is that uh, originally this language was contained in an application note. It was contained in Application Note 7 of Guideline 5G 1.3. The Commission moved it into the departure part of the Guidelines Manual, Chapter 5, Part K, and voted to do so prior to the enactment of the PROTECT Act. Okay. So uh, that's why we have that new departure language at 5K 2.23. Well, then also, really, it's not really new departure language if it was simply moved from the application note to Chapter 5, Part K. You're absolutely so right. it's not in violation then. But that's okay. right. Okay. All right. right. Just needed to clarify that. All right. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to talk about in, in reference to the 2003 amendments is the voluntary manslaughter and then quickly miscellaneous amendments. Uh, as Charlie mentioned earlier, we always accept comments from the field. We're very receptive to what various groups have to say, what those that are in the field practicing on a daily basis know about the cases. And, and what they have to say about them and the concerns they have. And the changes regarding involuntary manslaughter are specifically responses to um, concerns that were raised by the field in that the, the sentences for these types of offenses are simply too low. So as a response to that, uh, the Commission increased base offense levels from a 10 to a 12 if the offense involved criminally negligent behavior and from a 14 to an 18 if the conduct was reckless, if the offense involved conduct that was reckless. Uh, the concern that came from the field was that uh, defendants who are being sentenced for involuntary manslaughter, let's say at the state level, are receiving sentences that are much higher than those similarly situated defendants at the federal level. And so, of course, the concern is that that's not, that's not equitable, that's not fair. And uh, in response to that, the Commission raised the base offense levels. The Commission is continuing to look at these offense levels and may again raise them um, in the future, so that's uh, keep that in mind as well. Moving on to miscellaneous amendments. There are a number of miscellaneous amendments this amendment cycle, as there are every amendment cycle. However, there's only three that I want to touch on that, that we think are, are important. 
to focus on right now. And the first one is an amendment to 1B1.1. Uh, this is the guideline that talks about general application instructions when you're working through the guideline manual. And we've amended this guideline to emphasize that application instructions are applied in the order presented in the guideline. In, order you, in other words, you start at the beginning of the book and work your way through to the end. You can't pick and choose, start out of chapter three and then go back to chapter two. You gotta start out of chapter one and work your way in order through to the end. We've also clarified that application is cumulative meaning that if you're, you're doing your chapter two calculations and you're applying specific offense characteristics, you add them all, if they apply, they apply. You add them all together as they apply. Even if it appears that you may be applying them on the basis of the same conduct. Uh, the general rule to remember here is that it's not double counting unless we, we say it's, it is double counting. And there are instances in which we will tell you. If you have, have applied, for example, a specific offense characteristic at Chapter 2, you may get to a Chapter 3 adjustment and you're told in the commentary there, if you've applied the specific offense characteristic in your Chapter 2 calculations, do not apply it for Chapter 3. So that's uh, important to keep in mind there. Secondly, Red phosphorus has been added to the guideline at 2D1.11. 2D1.11 is the guideline relating to uh, uh, chemicals. Those of you who are familiar with methamphetamine cases know very well that red phosphorus is used in the production of methamphetamine. Uh, because of the, the growing number of methamphetamine cases that the courts are seeing, uh, we felt it was necessary to add red phosphorus uh, into the guideline at 2D1.11 to accommodate uh, courts that are seeing cases involving red phosphorus, not only in large quantities, but also in the production of methamphetamine. And lastly, um, the computer enhancement at 2G2.2B5, trafficking uh, um, in child pornography, has been amended to include receipt and distribution as part of this specific offense characteristic. And uh, again, uh, these guidelines are going to continue to change, not only as a result of the PROTECT Act, but because of the nature of these types of offenses. Specifically, when you talk about defendants committing these types of offenses mm -hmm. with computers and other technology that, that comes about, um, I think these guidelines, it's safe to say these guidelines uh, will, will evolve um, quite a bit in the next few years. Absolutely. Well, that was a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> But we've gotten, we talked about all of the amendments. We talked about all the PROTECT Act amendments, uh, effective April 30th, May 30th, and October the 27th. We also went through the majority of the uh, regular cycle amendments that took effect on uh, November the 1st of this year. Uh, as always, we encourage you to take a look at our website at www.ussc.gov or give us a call on the helpline at 202-502-4545 if you have any questions regarding these amendments or any other topics you would like to talk to us right. about. Uh, there's some great information on our website and we of course are always available on the helpline to help you with any issues that may arise as a result of these amendments. We want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, don't forget your evaluation forms. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Please fax those in to us. We, we'd like to hear from you so that we can plan our future broadcasts. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.